All right, this is a review of fluid mechanics. This part's gonna look at pressure and buoyancy. Now, pressure is a fairly easy topic. It's force per unit area. And we look at pressure in two topics in physics too, which are fluids and thermo. And in both topics, it's important to understand what's actually going on when there's pressure on something in a fluid. And that's because there's a bunch of molecules in a fluid that are kind of always bouncing around. So I have a bear underwater, I think, I'm not an expert on zoology. And there are a bunch of molecules that are bouncing off the bear. So a water molecule hits the bear and rebounds. And the reason why there's a pressure on the bear, well, there's a force because all those water molecules, they're going to hit the bear and change momentum. So we know that force is a change in momentum over a change in time. So that's a force. And that's occurring per unit area because the bear would have a cross-sectional area. And that's exerting a pressure on the bear. Now, in terms of hydrostatic pressure, hydrostatic pressure is what you feel when you go underwater. And that's due to a bunch of fluid being above you. So if you're underwater, there's a bunch of water above you. Water obviously has weight and it's exerting a downward force on you. So again, if I have this bear in the water, there is a column right above the bear of water. And that column of water is gonna have a weight. And that downward force of weight is gonna exert a force on the bear. And that's gonna be just in the area above the bear, not all the water, just the one in the direct area above the bear. So it's gonna be that weight per cross-sectional area. And that's gonna be the hydrostatic pressure. Now there's a formula for hydrostatic pressure. It's a fairly easy formula, but as a physics two student, you should know how to derive it. So we're gonna go ahead and look at the derivation for it. Okay, so a flat disc of radius R is at the bottom of a tank of water that has a height of H. We're gonna drive an expression for the pressure on that disc due to the water above it. And when we say the water above it, we don't mean all the water in the tank. We only refer to the water directly above it. So this is a circular disc. So there's a cylinder of water directly above it. And that cylinder is gonna exert a pressure on it because there's a force of weight of that water. So weight is mg, so it's the mass of the water per unit area for that disc. Now, how do we find the mass of the water? Well, we're gonna to have to use two things here. The first one is something that's given on the AP exam. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. It's not a good number to commit to memory. And the other thing is the definition of density itself. So that's density. Density is mass over volume. So if we use that, we can get that the mass of the water is the density of the water times the volume of the water. So if we make that substitution for mass, we have the density of water times the volume of the water. So this is a cylinder. So the volume of the cylinder is going to be the cross-sectional area, which is pi r squared, which is a circle, times the height. So that's our volume. So that's our mass, rho pi r squared h times g. Let's give us our weight over the cross-sectional area. So this is a circle. So we get pi r squared for the area of a circle. And pi r squared cancels out. The cross-sectional area of that water will cancel out, and it'll always cancel out. So the hydrostatic pressure, this is the formula for it, is rho g h. And that's the hydrostatic pressure formula. It's a fairly easy formula, but you should know that derivation as an AP Physics student. This is a pretty common question to see in AP Physics. This is a question where you have a bunch of different container shapes, and the question's asking, so you have a chart at the bottom of different containers. They have the same height, but different shapes. Rank the hydrostatic force in each case. Don't think too hard about this one. In each case, the turtle has the same height h of water above him, so he has the same weight of water above him, and therefore, we're at the same pressures. The pressures here are all the same because the height of the water is the same. Therefore, you're gonna have the same exact weight above the turtle, so you have the same force, obviously the same area, and you get the same pressure in all four cases. Here's the underwater bear again, and we're gonna look at the total pressure on him due to the weight of the fluid above him. So we established that there's water above him exerting a downward force, but that's not the only fluid in, in play here. There's also all this air. So there's a column of water exerting a downward force. There's also a column of air. And that column of air is gonna exert a pressure as well. So we have hydrostatic pressure, that's due to the water above him. Then we have what's called atmospheric pressure because there's the entire atmosphere, which is full of air, exerting a downward force on the bear. And that's called atmospheric pressure. 
Atmospheric pressure is actually pretty significant. It's 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals, which is a lot of pressure, but you're accustomed to it, so you don't really feel the atmospheric pressure unless you switch altitude drastically because at higher altitudes you have less pressure. Now, this pressure is pretty big, but it, it's equal to the entire atmosphere's pressure, which is also equal to only 10 meters of water. So 10 meters of water has the same pressure as the entire Earth's atmosphere, which is pretty high, of air. And that's because air has a density of only about 1.2, where water has a density of 1,000. And that's why atmospheric pressure, there, it's significant because there's a lot of atmosphere, not because air is necessarily dense. And the total pressure on something is the atmospheric pressure and any fluid above it, such as water. But that's not really what you're going to measure if you measure pressure. If you measure pressure, you're going to measure gauge pressure. So gauge pressure is what you can actually measure because if you have a pressure gauge, which is called a barometer, it, it's at atmospheric pressure. It can't measure atmospheric pressure because that's just where it exists at. It's only going to measure additional pressure above atmospheric pressure. So in order to find the absolute pressure, you have to take your gauge pressure and then add the atmospheric pressure. This is a pretty simple sample question about pressure. So we have a cylindrical container with a radius of 0.1 meters. It's filled with water, has a density of 1,000, to a height of 0.2 meters. On top of the water is a liquid with half the density of water, so 500. Also filled with a height of 0.2 meters. Find the absolute pressure at the bottom of the container. Now, this cross-section radius R doesn't matter because we showed that cross-section area cancels out. So we'll go ahead and find the gauge pressure first. So the gauge pressure is rho GH for the water plus rho GH for the other liquid, which is rho over 2 GH. Let me just plug in numbers. So for the water, we have 1,000 times 10 times 0.2. And then for the liquid, we have 500 times 10 times 0.2. And our answer for the gauge pressure, this is just due to the liquid above it, that's 3,000 pascals. Then to find the absolute pressure, we have to add atmospheric pressure, which is denoted here by P sub 0. So there's atmospheric pressure, 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals plus 3,000 pascals. Notice most of the pressure here is atmospheric pressure. So the liquid, because there's so little liquid, um, it's only a small minority of the total pressure here. Most of the pressure pushing down on the bottom of the container is just the atmosphere pushing on the container. And then adding those two up, the final answer is 1.04 times 10 to the fifth pascals. The next big topic in fluids is buoyancy. So with hydrostatic pressure, we looked at the downward force of water on something underwater. Now we're going to look at the fact that there's an upward force in everything. So everything in water, either fully submerged or partially submerged, is going to have an upward force on it no matter what. And let's look at this fish here. So this fish has forces on all four sides of them. Here's the forces on the two sides, the left and the right side. Now these two forces are equal and opposite, so they're going to cancel out, and they're not going to exert a net force on the fish. We talk about the force above them. So there's a column of water above the fish. There's a downward force on the fish, which is related to the hydrostatic pressure. Now let's look at the bottom of the fish. Now in this case, you have the greatest upward force. Now why is there an upward force? Well, for the downward force, there's all this water above the fish. That's going to exert a downward force on the fish. Now if you think about the point at the bottom of the fish right here, well, there's a bunch of water above basically the water down here. So the water below the fish is pushing up on all the water above that point due to Newton's third law. So because the force down here is greater than the force up here, you have a net upward force. And that's always going to happen because if something's underwater, the force pushing up at the bottom of the thing is bigger than the force pushing down at the top of it. That's what's going to cause what's called the buoyant force. In the third century BC, there was a guy named Archimedes, and he discovered that when he went into a bathtub, it displaced a bunch of water. His body displaced water. And he was able to use this fact to calculate the buoyant force. So he determined that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the water that you're displacing when you go into water. Okay, so if you put something in water like this block here, it's going to, so let's say it's at the fill line, this water is at the top. If you put the block in, there's going to be water displaced, it's going to drain out, and that's the amount of displaced water. And the net upward force on something, again, this is just Newton's third law, the net upward force on the water 
it's going to be equal to the weight of the water that's displaced. And that's going to be the mass of the displaced water times gravity, because weight is mg. If you use the fact that density is mass over volume, you get this equation here, the buoyant force equals rho vg. This is Archimedes' law. It gives the buoyant force for an object that displaces water when it's either fully or partially submerged. Whether it's fully or partially submerged, that's where people are going to make mistakes because this volume that's displaced, it's only the volume of the object if the object's completely underwater. If it's not, you have to do a bit more work there. And this is just basically a force. So in, a, in most questions in AP physics, what you're going to see is an object's in the water. There's multiple forces on it. One of the forces is the buoyant force. The buoyant force will always, always, always be upwards. So you basically have to, for these types of questions, do F equals MA, with the buoyant force being one of the forces. Here's a situation where a block is partially submerged in water. So it's a block with a density of 800. So it's less dense than water, which means it's going to float on water. It's going to have a total side length of L. That's kind of the long side. And then of that length L, a length of H is underwater. And the question is, how much of it is submerged? What's the fraction H over L? So this is a question in physics where forces are at play. So that means we're going to start off by drawing a free body diagram. And this one's simple. There's two forces. Gravity, the weight of the block, that points down. And the buoyant force is up. Now we have F equals MA. So in this case, there is no acceleration because it's stationary. We'll say buoyant force is up and gravity is down. And due to that, the buoyant force equals the force of gravity. Okay, so the buoyant force is given by Archimedes' law. So the buoyant force is the weight of the water displaced. So that's the density of water times the volume displaced, which is the volume of water that's displaced by the block, times g. So that's the buoyant force. That equals the weight of the block. So the weight of the block, we're not given the mass of the block. So the mass of the block is the density of the block times the volume of the block times gravity. And the acceleration of gravity cancels out there. And then let's look at the volume. So there's two volumes here. Volume displaced. Um, for the volume displaced, that's only the part that's underwater. So the volume displaced would be this volume here. So that's going to be, it's a rectangular prism, so it's going to be the cross-sectional area times the height. So that's the volume displaced. And then on the right side, we have the block's mass, which is its density times its entire volume. So this is going to be the whole volume of the entire block. So that's going to be L times A. And the cross-sectional area cancels out, which it always does. And for solving for the fraction h over l, the fraction h over l is the density of the block over the density of water. So in this case, for the density of 800, we're going to get that 80% of the block is going to be underwater. So in that last question, we got that the proportion of the block that was underwater was equal to the ratio of its density to the ratio of water. And that ratio has a name which is specific gravity. Specific gravity is the ratio of the density of an object to the density of water, which is 1,000. And specific gravity is useful because we can use it for kind of two things. The first is to determine whether an object will float or sink. If specific gravity is less than one, meaning it's less than some gravity, an object's gonna float. And the proportion underwater is equal to the specific gravity. And then of course, if an object has a specific gravity greater than one, that means it's more dense than water. That means that 100% of it's underwater and that object's gonna sink in water. Here's a question that looks at something that the College Board asks about a lot, which is you're given a spring scale reading when something's in air and then when it's submerged in water. So in this case, you have a spring scale that's used to determine the density of a block. The reading when the block is in air is 5. So this reading right here, that's going to give the weight of the block because in this case, there's just two forces. Uh, the spring scale reading and the weight of the block. So the weight of the block here is going to be 5 newtons. And then when you put the block into water, you're going to get a spring scale reading of 3 newtons. And the question is to calculate the density of the block. Okay, so here's the free body diagram in water. Here, the spring scale reading is still upwards. The weight of the block is downwards. We have one additional force. That's going to be the buoyant force going up. In this case, it's suspended, so it's not moving. So for this picture, 
the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. And we have the spring scale and buoyancy being upwards and the weight being downwards. So from that, we can solve for the buoyant force. The buoyant force is going to be the weight, which is pointing down, minus the spring scale, which is pointing up. So that's going to be 5 minus 3. So the buoyant force here is 2 newtons. And we're not going to be able to get the density of the block right away, but we're going to use the fact that the buoyancy or the buoyant force is 2 newtons to calculate the volume of the block. So we can go here and say the buoyant force, which we know is 2, is the density of water. The buoyant force always uses the density of water because it's the weight of the displaced water times the volume displaced. And the thing is here, this displaced volume, this is just the volume of the block because the block is fully submerged. When something's fully submerged, the volume displaced is just the volume of that thing times g. So the volume of the block, which is the volume displaced, or the same volume, that's going to be the buoyant force over the density of water, which is known as 1,000. It's a constant, times g, which is another constant. So the volume displaced is the buoyant force of 2 over the density of water, which is 1,000, times g. And you get that the volume of the block, which is the displaced volume as well, is 2 times 10 to the negative 4 cubic meters. And now the question is to determine the density of the block. So now we know that the weight of the block is the mass of the block times gravity. And the mass of the block is going to be the density of the block times the volume of the block. But these two are the same volume. The volume of the block is the displaced volume again because it's submerged. This is only true when an object is fully submerged times g. So from that, the density of the block is its weight over its volume times g, and then you just plug in numbers. So that's 5 over 2 times 10 to the negative 4 times g. And for that one, you're going to get 2,500 kilograms per cubic meter. And that is much more dense than water, which is why this block does sink into water. And there you go. Here's a pretty typical free response type question. This is a question where this little emoji here, which is like a balloon or something, it's less dense than water and it's being held down by a rope. So we have a spherical emoji of radius 0.1 meters. It's tied to the rope and submerged in a tank of water as shown. The emoji itself has a mass of two kilograms. Calculate the tension of the rope. So this is a force question. And this is a physics question. So the first thing we're going to do is draw a free body diagram, label the forces, and then do F equals MA. So step one, free body diagram. So we have three forces here. The first one is the buoyant force. Remember, buoyant force is always up. So buoyant forces are upward force, trying to lift this emoji up to the top of the water. And then the weight of the object, which is mg, is obviously down because it's the force of gravity. And then in this question, it's kind of being tied down. This is an object that's trying to float. The rope's below it, so it's holding it down. So that means that the tension is a downward tension. And there's our three forces. So now we set up F equals ma. Now this is an object where it's not moving. So the sum of the forces is zero. So the positive direction here is pretty arbitrary. So we're just going to take the upward direction as positive. So there we go. The sum of the forces is Fe. That's our positive force because it's up. Tension and gravity are both down, so we define them as negative. And this one's not moving, so the sum of forces is zero. Now we just go ahead and solve for our tension. And there it is. It's Fb minus mg. Now our buoyant force here, if we use Archimedes' law, it's the density of water times the volume displaced times g. So there's the buoyant force. Now in this case, the volume displaced here that's just equal to the volume of the object because the entire object is submerged. When an entire object is submerged, the displaced volume is just the, ob the volume of the object. And here's all the numbers plugged in. So this is the density of water. And then the volume displaced is the volume of a sphere. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed times g. So that's our buoyant force minus the weight, which is just mg. And then when you plug in numbers, you're going to get a final answer of 
22 newtons, so that's the tension. Part B is a conceptual question looking at if we changed a couple of things, how would it change the 22 newtons from part A for the tension? Uh, the first part says if the emoji were submerged at a greater depth, how would it change the tension? Well, buoyant force does not change with depth. As long as something's completely submerged, which this is, completely submerged still, you're going to have a constant buoyant force. So part one is not going to change the answer to part A. So you have no change because buoyant force does not depend on depth. Now part two, if the emoji had the same mass but a greater radius. Well, if the radius were bigger, so if we increase the radius, we're going to get a bigger volume displaced. Remember, this thing's fully submerged, so it's displacing all its volume in water. If it's a bigger sphere here, there's going to be more volume of water displaced. It's going to be a bigger buoyant force. So if the buoyant force is going to increase, that's a bigger force trying to make it go up. So the tension is tying it down. So I have a bigger buoyant force. So I'm going to have to have a greater tension. So we're going to have more tension in this case. Part C says, OK, now that rope is cut. And we know that the buoyant force is greater than gravity. So this is going to rise up to the top of the surface. Calculate the acceleration of the emoji. So again, it's a force question. So we're going to draw a free body diagram. Do f equals ma in the direction of motion, this one's moving, and then solve. And there's the free body diagram. So f equals ma, which is the buoyant force minus mg. And then we go ahead and solve for the acceleration. So there's the acceleration. It's the buoyant force minus mg over m. Here's the numbers plugged in. It's the same numbers as part A. So you just plug in numbers, and you get your final answer. And the final answer is the acceleration upwards is 11 meters per second. So we'd say the final answer is 11 meters per second, and it's an acceleration, so it's a vector. It has direction. That direction is upwards. And that is pressure and buoyancy.